first duel as a gentleman, and before I did so, that night around a fire, he performed this poem, written by an obscure by the name of Henri de Gautier, and he's going to perform it for you. I highly suggest you listen to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Elijah Kemp. With a start, a rap upon my door. When good sir came to call, his daughter a bit before. If I lay there for a moment, was all as it could seem. Was this all reality or was it but a dream? Then suddenly it came most clear. It was my servant at the door. And he had come and waited me as a thousand times before. And then it occurred to me why such an early call. There was an appointment I'd agreed to last night down in the hall. Oh, there had been a grand occasion, a gathering extraordinaire. You see, the Duke had thrown a party, and the whole county had been there. And I had been long conversing with the gentleman of the court on the art of bowing, but to the noble sport. He said, Would you ever wrong? Your hat should sweep just past your knee. Not so, said I, in my turn. I'll have to disagree. Tis only proper when you bow that your hat there brush the floor. This, I said, is what's correct, not less, nothing more. Do you think, he said, I know not wrong from right? Only my own, really not been shown, this appeared to be in right. He said, am I to understand from you I should be schooled? I, I said, a bit too loud, lest you wish to be a fool. In silence, I could through the hall, the goblet landed at my feet. However, we were gentlemen, would not brawl in the street. We'd set a proper time and place, and appear at the appointed hour. The time is the extreme written. The place is the old church tower. Now as I dressed, my spirits were high, I had waited for so long, my person was a gentleman had finally begun. I took my sword into my hand, cutting all that I need, all the while mulling over what my instructor told me he. Don't hold your blade too tightly, and don't close up your stance, and thrust the tip, don't push it, lad, it's a rapier, not a lance. Keep your elbow firm, and tuck your chin in tight, for remember, it doesn't matter that you win if you didn't do it right. And for goodness sake, if nothing else, bow first and do your crossing, or we won't put braces on our side. And the sun will pour my own watching. Now as I walked the streets, I passed the school I'd attended as a lad. And as I strolled the town market, I was suddenly stricken sad. No, not because I'd not see another blossom of flower, but that no one would see me in this my finest hour. You see, duels are a private thing, not a spectator's that the crowds into a tournament thing. But before I knew it, I had reached the church. I could see the room I saw, not remembering the mile I had walked and other jumped across the lot. I met the man with whom I fight with a nod of my head. And he glared back with disgust. Something they said. Oh yes, a point on etiquette. We were not supposed to speak. At this juncture, talk was useless to attempt to play second. Now then, down to business, let nothing lessen our resolve. We'll engage in single combat until justice has been solved. Till each is truly satisfied that his honor has been repaired, or until a fatal wounding, or one's life being spared. For only then can it be said that justice has been done, because only then the gentleman can know that he has won. And so I entered on this field, prepared to risk my life, to prove in the eyes of God which one of us was right, right? a bow to the crown, a salute to my opponent, who must be courteous at all costs. Now it starts out slow. No one's in haste. <coughs> each circle, each in turn. Each looking for a weakness in the to be learned. Then all at once, his first engage, a simple thrust in carte. The second move, a bit more involved, a beat double step the shade. And still no trouble on my part, I defend the play his dismay. And now it's my turn to attack, and my prowess I shall prove. A pink reverse thrust over his left arm, which was my most favorite move. And to my surprise, it landed home. He hadn't blocked any time. And not a fatal wound by any call, still the first blood was mine. So I stepped back smart, gave salute, called attention to my blow, and said, Good sir, you will yield to the circle that go. Not yet, he said, it's but a scratch on the news of that leash. But if thou art still willing, boy, I've much yet left to teach. Very well, I said, a little bothered by his tone. However, not too worried, for I had lessons of my own. And as we continued, my confidence grew. For every thrust he made without a problem, I could speak out of easily. 
Now every swordsman knows, don't let your guard down, not an ounce. Just when you're sure that you've won, as then you're in it with an ounce. And here was my fatal flaw. I just let down a bit. One parry made, one kill too late, and my opponent scored a hit. It landed well, a solid ball. I hadn't even seen it thrown, yet there was no denying blood through my shirt was shown. It landed on my upper arm, and while not my favorite hand, still it was a gaping wound on this field I should not stand. To continue might cost my life. I would fairly bleed here on this field, and no one would be dishonored if to this man I would yield. However, anger filled my heart, and I'd not be forced to say, my lord, in this matter you were right. You've won fairly today. Instead, spurred on by rage, I screamed, You've not yet won this bout. While I still stand and you still live, we must still work this out. And without letting him speak a word, either courteous or no, I left him and gave him thrust at least a hundred blows. Like a dervish I left on him, who is now on the retreat, not one attack with the advance, nor no move like that be. And with a grand salute, I beat fate, tri triple disengage, and landed home, left center chest, buried well half the blade. My opponent looked through his wound as the sword fell to the ground. And then he grunts about the field as if he heard a sound. Perhaps, perhaps it was the chariots of death which held it forth with haste, but to my surprise, there seemed to be no fear upon his face. Instead, he looked deep into my eyes, a stare which pierced my heart, and said, Well struck. Please forgive me, sir.